Pay close attention. What you're seeing today is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Now, we're sure many of you are familiar with the ongoing investigation at Penn State in regards to the sexual allegations of child abuse. In a recent report, Tim Curley and Gary Schultz of Penn State's athletic program each one face counts of felony, perjury, and a misdemeanor charge of failing to report allegations of abuse to police concerning Jerry Sandusky and young men after they, that is the police, were informed of the incident in 2002. Now, of course, all three men have denied the allegations. And Joseph Amandola, the attorney for Jerry Sandusky, stated his client is innocent of the sex charges against him. Now, he also said Sandusky is frustrated that he can't defend himself publicly and saddened that the scandal has brought down Paterno, who is the head coach of Penn State University. Amandola said he is building his case to defend Sandusky, finding and interviewing witnesses. Now, Pennsylvania Attorney General Linda Kelly said Paterno, who informed, informed Curley of the 2002 incident after the coach learned of it from Michael McQuarrie, the assistant of the graduate assistant, fulfilled his legal reporting obligation and is not a target of continuing state grand jury investigation. Another potential missed opportunity to expose Sandusky, according to the grand jury, occurred in 2002 when a janitor allegedly witnessed Sandusky performing oral sex on a boy in the Penn State locker room showers. The emotionally shaken janitor who described the incident to co-workers that night did not report the incident to authorities because he and others feared losing their jobs, the report says. The janitor, who saw the incident, now suffers from dementia and was declared incompetent to testify before the grand jury. Now, one of his former co-workers, however, testified that the witness told him on the night the alleged incident occurred, I just witnessed something in there I'll never forget. Now, the 2002 incident at the heart of the perjury case against Curley and Schultz involved a 10-year-old boy designated as victim two. McQuarrie, now an assistant football coach, coach, allegedly saw the child being raped in the shower by Sandusky. He reported the incident the next day to Paterno, who relayed information to Curley. Now, the encounter was never reported to the police. That association began as early as 2005, according to the grand jury report, when the boy met Sandusky through the coach's charity. Their encounters progressed from outings to sleepovers at Sandusky's home, where the coach allegedly began visiting the boy in the basement bedroom to massage and crack his back, the report said. The activities led to more sexually explicit encounters. In 2007 and 2008, the victim testified Sandusky allegedly performed oral sex on him more than 20 times, the grand jury report says. Now, victim one did not want to engage in sexual contact with Sandusky and knew it was wrong, according to the grand jury report, adding that the boy asked his mother to tell Sandusky that he was not home when the coach called the boy's house. Now, of course, these occurrences are not isolated cases. In fact, hundreds of boys and girls are molested every day within our global society. And most of these cases go unreported, leaving this children, these children to grow up and carry with them the emotional burden of being sexually abused, which often leads them to becoming abusers themselves. But more on that when we return to the studio. Right now, we're going to go to our field correspondent, Jeffrey Heimerman, who has more shocking developments in this sinister case. Jeff, what have you found out? Katan, many new developments are coming forth even as we speak. As you know, this case goes back to 1998, when the mother of one of the victims suspected something had taken place with Jerry Sandusky and her son after Jerry dropped her son off, both having wet hair. After she notified the university police, the case was eventually turned over to the center county district attorney, Ray Gricar. Now, Ray Gricar never prosecuted Jerry Sandusky at the time. And here's where the story really takes a strange twist. 
In April 2005, the then District Attorney Ray Gricar mysteriously disappeared. His car was found some 50 miles away from his home with his keys, wallet, and laptop all missing. Now his body has still never been recovered. The laptop was found sometime later in a nearby river with the hard drive missing. Katan, one would have to wonder why someone as important and high up as a district attorney would all of a sudden disappear. Wow. Wow, that's, that's really strange. Does anybody have any other ideas as to what's going on or any other strange occurrences? Katan, another shocking and disturbing development in this case was made by Pittsburgh radio host Mark Madden. Now, in April of this year, he wrote a story revealing Penn State is behind much of the cover-up of the Jerry Sandusky alleged child rape uh, sex scandal going on right now that's been unfolding this past week. Now, at the time, many people really didn't pay much attention to it, but right now it's looking extremely credible. Now, in an interview with the Dennis and the Callahan show, this is what host Mark Madden had to say. He said, I can give you a rumor and I can give you something I think might happen. I hear there's a rumor and that there will be more shocking development from the Second Mile Foundation. And hold on to your stomachs, boys, this is gross. I will use the only language I can that Jerry Sandusky and the Second Mile were pimping out young boys to rich donors. He went on to say, I normally abhor giving rumors credence, but the whole Sandusky scandal started out as a rumor and it gets deeper and more disgusting all the time. Mark Mann went on to say, another thing I think may eventually become uncovered, and I talked about this in my original article in April, is that I think they'll find out that Jerry Sandusky was told that he had to retire in exchange for a cover-up. If you look at the timeline, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Still quoting. My opinion is when Sandusky quit, everybody knew, not just Penn State. Madden added, I think it was a very poorly kept secret about college football in general, and that is why he never coached in college football again and retired at a relatively young age. That's a young age for a coach, certainly. At Catan, it looks like the second mile was the perfect cover-up for Jerry Sandusky. Amazing. What methods of persuasion did he use to draw in these victims? Well, Katan, one of, the method, one of the methods of persuasion that Jerry Sandusky used on his victims was the giving of gifts. Victims testified receiving shoes, clothes, golf clubs, hockey gear, even tickets to the college football games at Penn State. Now, one victim even testified that Jerry Sandusky gave him $50 to buy marijuana, that he drove him there to pick it up and then let him smoke it on the way home. Wow, it's amazing how easily young victims are taken advantage of by those who lack self-control. In fact, further statistics show that 90% of the predators who molest children have had some type of involvement with pornography. According to Charles Keating of Citizens for Decency Through Law, research reveals that 77% of child molesters of boys and 87% of child molesters of girls admitted imitating the sexual behavior they had seen in pornography they had watched. Roughly 33% of girls and 14% of boys are molested before the age of 18, according to the U.S. Justice Department. Now, nearly two-thirds of all sexual assaults reported involve minors, and roughly one-third involve children under the age of 12. More than 90% of all sexual victims know their perpetrator. Almost 50% of the offenders are household members, and 38% are already acquaintances with the victims. Now, the average serial child molester has between 360 and 380 victims in his lifetime. A child molester that seeks out boys will molest 150 boys before being caught and convicted. That's if he's caught and convicted. The most common ages of children when sexual abuse occurs are between 8 and 12. And 1.8 million of the 22.3 million adolescents in the United States have been sexually assaulted. Now, like rape, child molestation is one of the most underreported crimes. Only 1 to 10 percent are ever disclosed. The United States has the world's highest rape rate of the countries that publish such statistics. It's four times higher than Germany, 
13 times higher than England and 20 times higher than Japan. As an added note, Penn State has the third most profitable football program in the United States last season, reporting an income of $50 million. Now that's the income that they took in, the profit they took in after over $100 million in earnings through ticket sales, merchandise, endorsement, television rights, and so forth. Now that type of hit could fearfully put a dent in the university's pocketbook. Again, this is not the fault of any one individual or even one university. It's caused by a system that teaches everyone to become like Sodom and to be made like Gomorrah. A system ruled by the beast that sits on seven hills and rules the kings of the earth, as Revelation says. A system that, as Israel Hawkins has foretold over and over, that according to prophecy is falling and will completely fall on itself. Now the books, The Mark of the Beast, Volume 1 and 2, and the book Birth of the Nuclear Baby, The Explosion of Sin, go into great details outlining the path that mankind has taken in following the gods through the Catholic Church. The same Catholic Church that is that power that the prophet Moshe states that's surrounding the land and bringing its strength down. Join us next week as we bring you more news showing Bible prophecy as it's being fulfilled. I'm Katan Alexander with YPN News. Thank you for joining us.